What's up, guys? Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of Eat, Train, Prosper. Today, Brian and I are going to dig into a couple overflow questions we had from the prior week's episode, a little bit of a more in-depth discussion around some utility with shortened overload movements, and as always, some updates with what is going on with us. I think Brian is going to kick us off, as he Mm -hmm. usually does with our updates. So, Brian, take us off, my man. Yeah, so... Since the uh, last episode we did, I hit a new low on my diet, um, got down to 183.2, which is 0.4 pounds above my lowest low from the prior year and over two pounds below the low from two years ago. So I was right there. I'm teetering on the edge of that 182 range, which is kind of what I wanted to see before eating up into the photo shoot and then since that 183.2 uh things kind of imploded so here's kind of the story and the way that things went Uh, i hit 183.2 everything was cool the next day hit 184.0 just kind of natural fluctuations that night uh, of the 184 I was heading to uh, an event with some friends and I knew there was going to be like some beer, some beer pong. And, um, you know, they were going to have it catered by a Mexican place. There was going to be desserts, all these different things. And so I planned on doing what I usually do in these situations and what has worked for me for the 12 weeks leading up to the diet thus far. And I was just going to eat, you know, 800, maybe a thousand calories for the day before this event. And then that would leave me. 1500 calories on the low side to still be like within my range of kind of what I'm going for. Well, I was really hungry all day. I literally was probably the hungriest that I've been ever this entire diet. So before even going to the party, I was at like 2200 calories or something like that. And I was at 200 grams of protein. I'd basically eaten like an entire days of food before even like heading to this event. Right. And then we got to the event and I, I brought a, uh, a white claw. I was like, I'll have one white claw. It's 170 calories and I'll just like sip on this throughout the night. Um, well, that quickly turned into like two white claws. And then someone brought the beer pong table out. And before I knew it, I'd played six games of beer pong, eaten the Mexican food that they catered with. Of course, I kept it to chicken, rice and cauliflower. So like I did OK, but but. Even without the beer, I think I probably had, you know, 500 calories of food. So therefore, I'm already above my daily calories for the day. And then I had like, you know, eight beers. So um, so that happened on Friday night. And then uh, my weight actually did okay. Like I kind of pulled it back together. And as of yesterday, it had gone back down to 184.8. So still kind of above where I want it to be, but it's at least like hanging out in like a one pound range. I figure, you know, you drop some of that glycogen, no big deal, right? Then it's Kim's birthday yesterday. It's Monday, 620. Kim is... uh is celebrating and i as the supportive husband must celebrate as well of course and i want to it's not it's not like i feel this pressure but but same idea i basically went into the day being like okay i'm going to eat 800 or a thousand calories and then i'll have 1500 calories to eat at dinner with her at night and that was my plan the literal same thing happened i got i I got through the day and like i just kept eating i was so hungry that i was at 2100 calories before we even went out to dinner last night and then i had like a steak and a couple fries and some spinach and a bite of her dessert and a beer and now i'm who knows maybe i'm at like 3500 calories or something like that so um in the last like four days i've had two days that just like blew the plan out of the water um Emotionally, I just I'm, I'm I just am lacking commitment. I don't want to do it anymore. It's like a, a switch was flipped when I hit that 183.2, and like all of the hunger that I was able to keep down, and all of the like emotional restraint that I was able to utilize through the last 12 weeks, it just. I just failed like it. Uh, I just didn't want to do it anymore. It's a, the the juice isn't worth the squeeze type saying like um, if it wasn't for the fact that I have this photo shoot on Tuesday uh, next week, like a week from today, I probably would have already just been like, you know, it's over, it's done, blah, blah, blah. But I feel this sense of commitment to the photo shoot, this sense of commitment to the people that have been following my journey on Instagram and all of this stuff. So. Um, I'm not 
like literally being like, fuck it. Like I'm just going to start eating cakes for the next seven days. Um, but I do 100% feel like I, I am not going to hit my 182 goal. I mean, I hit that 183.2. So it was like right there on the edge. But, but at this point I've kind of accepted that I've had these two big fuck ups in the last four days. I'm not going to hit 182. Um, I still more than likely will do the photo shoot at the exact same weight that I've done it the prior years because I still have a number of pounds to play with in there and I can still eat up. I probably don't deserve now five days of eating up. I'm probably going to give myself two or three days of eating up into it. Uh, maybe do it a little bit more mildly, but, um, anyways, that's my, um, that's my, my situation at the moment. And I'm like partially disappointed and also like partially relieved to be on here talking to you guys and just kind of coming to terms with everything that's been going through my brain. So, um, that's the state of things nutritionally at the moment. Do you mind if I, if I ping you and, and dig into a little bit of this? I think it's a very, yeah, of course, man. It's a very cool, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say it's cool. That's, that's, a. Uh, uh, kind of a dickheaded thing of me. It's a very unique and interesting uh, conversation to have between like two people who, who are versed here. So I think it's a great uh, kind of um, use case for, for the for the listeners. So I've, I have a couple mm -hmm. thoughts and just kind of questions that I wanted to lead into it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. With this third kind of go around with this diet compared to the previous two, you were starting at a much closer striking distance this year versus the past two years. Is, am I correct in that? Yeah, about five pounds closer, striking distance. And the diet was shorter as well, yeah. In terms of shorter, was it more aggressive or was it just shorter because you were starting closer to the end goal? Like, if correct me if I'm wrong, in the, in the past two years, wasn't the diet, wasn't the photo shoot in like August timeframe? September, yeah. So prior years, I dieted from like April, the end of April. Um, and it took all the way through September. So it was a much, much more gradual pace. Like I, I guess I had to lose, uh, 17 pounds instead of 14 or 13. So it was slightly more, but, but it wasn't just a month longer. It was like two months longer. So I, in the past years, I'd had this two week diet break refeed period in the middle. And this year I didn't have that at all. I was just going straight all the way through. And I think I mentioned on the prior episodes that I actually hadn't even done any refeeds this whole diet either. I had stayed within 300 calories of my calorie target on either side every single day for 12 straight weeks, not a single refeed day or like a, you know, oopsie day or anything like that. Um, so I think there was certainly like some emotional pieces to that, you know, not having a two week period in there where, where you can reset and it's almost like breaking the diet into like two, nine week periods instead of one 18 week period type thing. Yeah. And, and that's uh, along the lines of, of what I will see with, with clientele as well. It's not so much that the like diet break or the reef, well, refeeds can really have like a, a physiological uh, benefit, especially in an acute setting, but it's really just like a psychological break from like being so on top of it. And then really you get the site or the, you get the psychological and you get physiological benefits of it too, of just like you're replenishing muscle glycogen, you're eating a higher, you know, volume of food, you get better uh, leptin signaling, like different, it, it does have physiological benefits as well. So I, I just wanted to kind of dig in a little bit and see, cause I, I, if I remembered correctly, and it sounds like I did a decent job there, the timing was you did take a different approach as opposed to the last, the prior two years, because you were you just didn't have as, as much to lose. Yeah, I didn't have as much to lose. And then I really want to make this a, a habit going forward to, to diet more in the spring than the summer. Um, because the last two years dieting in the summer was like, it was fine the first year because it was COVID and like it was the first year of COVID and nobody was out doing anything. The last year was really tough because people were kind of like starting to break free and like go do things and have social events. And then this year is even more so. And so, um, springtime is a much better time to do it because you're still kind of in the the malaise of winter it's not super nice out people aren't doing all sorts of tons of stuff and then as soon as june hits it's like school ends the world opens up everybody's doing stuff um so i definitely do want to continue with the idea of doing the diet in the spring instead of in the summer um, but maybe even things shift like a month earlier now. So instead of going late March to late June, maybe now it becomes like late February to late May or something like that. Um, 
And then, I, you know, the whole diet, I've been saying how great it is that I've just taken this linear approach and not done these refeeds or diet breaks or whatever, because I really, um, I really like not having to compromise my calories on subsequent days. So one of the inherent pieces of, of doing a, a refeed day or two is that you have to drop your calories on the other days to account for the refeed. And, and to me that, that, that almost makes it harder. Like it's like, Oh, you get this great day where like things feel semi-normal, but now as a result, you have to have like 1800 calories the next day or 2200 calories or whatever it is. And for me, it's just much easier to be like, Hey, 20, Five to 2,700. This is my range. I just stay in here and I just hit it, hit it like a robot each day. Um, so that was good for me. I just need to, to find a way that maybe it's like, if I can foresee what, what happened here, where like, maybe I just got a little too aggressive to get down to 183.2. Um, cause I had been stuck for a week and then I like really got aggressive and, and maybe it was just too much of a, of a dump. And then to the, to all the points that you made too, like, you know, the shorter diet, the more focused diet, the not having the diet breaks, like all of these pieces playing in. Yeah. I just wanted to, to kind of touch on that quickly. Cause there is like, we all have those different types of like personality characteristics that make certain uh, approaches, right? More psychologically appropriate or less appropriate. And I just wanted to kind of touch on that because I feel like too often people simplify fat loss and stuff. I mean, and don't get me wrong, it is simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy, right? The X's and O's are easy where the psychology comes in, um, especially with desires and different food focuses and being able to participate in social things. Like those are all the different like socio, hmm, so social aspects that, that really come into play that people don't talk about as much. And that's going to be something that will really vary, you know, individual to individual. So for, you know, the other coaches out there listening, this is a really important thing to just understand as you have different types of clients for sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, I appreciate that conversation. Um, before I jump into uh, some other stuff going on with me, any uh, updates you want to discuss real quick? Yeah, I guess the first one I have is I had a really, really cool conversation with um, the Every Calorie Counts podcast uh, last week. So we didn't talk as much like X's and O's of nutrition. It was a lot more of just like the travel lifestyle, how I set things up and a little bit more of the background there. And it was just a really cool, fun conversation to talk about some things that are, you know, obviously these massive parts of my life, but uh, I don't talk about as much um, because we're generally doing X's and O's of, of business, you know, training and nutrition type stuff. That's cool. I love those guys. I, uh, I always enjoy listening to them. Yeah. I can, I can cover a couple more of my updates. Yeah, sure. So sure, go for it. I wrapped up my neuro phase uh, with Alex. So we ran that for four weeks. And now today was my first day of the metabolic phase. And um, I don't want to say it sucked because that's like kind of negative, but like, fuck, I was on fire. <laughs> can you uh, can you give us a, a brief rundown of, uh, of what you did? Yeah. So today, um, today was chest supported. Um, bilateral pull down, right? So drag the, the thing over to, to the lat pull down. And it was five sets of 10 with uh, 40 seconds rest in between. Um, like a 20 RM type weight. So I tried to use like what would have been a 15 RM and I ran like I, I grabbed one of those apps. It helps like calculate things for you. And I couldn't maintain it. Not for a fucking chance in hell. Um, that one I, I fell off on pretty hard. Um, or I shouldn't say pretty hard. I think two stacks, two weight stacks um, to start. And then from there, we went into a, a thoracic cable row, which I love that setup. That's like probably one of my favorite row movements to do. And that one I started much more conservatively and was able to hold that weight uh, through it. We went into some rear delt stuff and then biceps. Uh, so it was kind of cool in that it was a shorter session. I was done in about like 50, 55 minutes. Um, but I mean, yeah, my arms and back was just completely blown out and I was like, yeah, I'm ready to, I'm ready to be done here. Uh, it's a different feeling for sure. It is. Um, 
but it, it was cool. I really, really did enjoy the the neuro block, though I kind of didn't want to stop because I was like, I'm just I'm just getting to these numbers that I want to hit, you know. So it was it was cool that even in like within four weeks, that in even with the under the you know the consideration that the first week is really just movement discovery, weight discovery, how quickly things really return. So um, I did have deadlifts in it. I haven't deadlifted in man, maybe 2018 was the last time I actually like did any real deadlifts. And if I would have had one more week, um, I like linearly loaded them. I would have taken like 405 for my last set of five, um, which would have been cool. Cause like, I mean, that's a weight I haven't really pulled in five years at this point. Um, yeah. And, and with better form too. And with better form. And what was really interesting, like is each week, even though the load was increasing, like my like it just, they felt better. Like my last set was moving better each week. I, it was really, really cool. It felt really strong. And then my final set of the hack squat, uh, had four plates per side. And that's like the f first time I think I've loaded that much in a hack squat and maybe potentially forever or potentially. Do you for know the what first brand time. it is? It's a Watson hack squat. So all the equipment here is Watson, um, which I was actually just talking with Alex. I do not like it. So the Watson equipment, it's really, it's really, it's engineered really like beautifully, like really clean welds. It, everything's like brushed steel. And then you, they make, man, this, this is a good build quality. And then you get into it and, and use it. And you're like, who the fuck designed these angles? Like, why are the angles like this? <laughs> so like I yeah. was on the pendulum. The pendulum is Cass so hates the pendulum, vertical. I think. It's so vertical. It's like straight up and down almost. And you're, and it's like, it's like they built it without understanding the purpose of what you want the machine for, you know, for it to pendulum for yeah, it to arc. It doesn't, yeah, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. arc. It's just like up. Um, and then the thing that's really interesting with the, with the Watson hack squat is there is a piston in the back and it changes the pitch of the angle. You know, you get what I'm saying? So you, you can shift you, up more vertical or, or lay back yeah, more. Yeah. Okay. But there's no like preset settings it's just an open piston so trying to replicate where you had it last week oh. to the week before like unless you bring a fucking like a, a ruler yeah, yeah. in you're, you're just like protractor yeah protractor what yeah exactly a protractor to <laughs> measure your fucking what's that like your uh the, your hypotenuse the right? degrees your, of angle yeah your a squared plus yeah. b squared equals c squared whatever like you just i'm just like ballparking like ah oh, this is approximately approximately at my belly button this is what i did last week um, yeah. so that's like kind of frustrating, but, uh, I made, the, I you know, make the best of it, but it is kind of funny. Cause I, at first sight, like, man, this equipment's, you know, beautiful. And then you get into it and use it and you're like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I've heard the Watson stuff isn't great. I think it's, it's English. It in is. The UK. I'm not hundred yep. percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also see you did a 50 kilogram press. Was that a dumbbell press incline? Yes. Um, no, that was, now I can't remember if it was incline or flat, flat press. Um, cause I was doing both or yeah, one, one was like 47.5. The other one was 50. You only have two and a half pound increment dumbbells, you know, here. And I, and I decided like week two, I'm not co converting weights back to pounds anymore. Yeah. Like I'm just, no, I wouldn't do that. Well, cause I, I would, because I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't know what this is. If, can I do this? You know, but then like, it kind of starts to mess with your head. Cause you're like, Oh man, this is 95 pounds. This is supposed to feel like X, but like yeah. when it comes to kilos, like I have a ballpark around where I am, uh, but I really don't. And I never, I don't think I would have pushed it that high if I knew what 50 kilos was. And then after I, I like looked it up and I was like, damn, that's a good set at that weight. It's about 110 pounds. Um, and it was yeah. a true RIR of one. And I was really, really pumped about that for sure. Especially again, in that's four awesome. weeks. I don't think I've yeah. touched that on dumbbells in a very, very long time, probably 10 years plus for sure. Yeah. I remember when I was in Austin doing that photo shoot with you and we were benching the hundreds for incline and you said that was the heaviest you'd done on that in a long time. So to go 50 kgs is 110 pounds, 111, something like that. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. So it does have um, me kind of excited, like potentially in the future, I might run like a, like a, I guess it's something similar, like a neuro block, but a little bit longer mm -hmm. with the, um, guys of if I give myself eight weeks, maybe 10 weeks, what could yeah. I do in terms of like, um, loading things a little bit there? 
Last question on the neuroblock. When you were doing this, was it uh, increasing weight each set? Like you had four sets of six or whatever it was, like six, six, four, four type thing. So was it like kind of like the first set was almost like a warm up, or would you consider the first set to still be like a work set? Was it like, you know, you went 70, 80, 90, 100, or was it more like 40, 60, 80, 100 or something like that? So fortunately, up until 40s here, the gym has two kilogram increments in weight in dumbbells. So they have a, like a, I could do like a 32, 34, 36, 38, or I could go a 34, 36, 38, 40. But then after 40, it goes by 2.5s. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what I would do. So like my first six would generally be around like a three RIR. Um, and then I would increase, you know, two kilograms uh, dumbbells. And then that next set of six would be about like a, a one to two RIR. Um, and then the fours I would push and then that last four, I would always try to be like, stay with, that, always make it that like one RIR. Mm -hmm. And was it a similar approach with hack too? Like you'd start with three plates, then maybe three and a half, then four type thing. Yeah. You know, I, what I was really doing there was like, I, I would load them about like 10 kilos, I think, um, each set. So like the first six, mm -hmm. And then for the second six, I added 10 kilos. Then when I went to the four, I would add another 10 kilos. And then my second four, I would add another 10 kilos. So I would add about like 40 yeah. kilos over, over it. So that's basically like starting with two and a half plates and then you go three plates, then three and a half plates, and then you finish with four plates. Yeah, kind approximately around there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I like that. Um, okay, cool. Well, I have an interesting topic, this part of my updates, which is that uh, this past week on top of all of these... Uh, nutritional flaws that I had. I also did two incredibly large cardiovascular events, which I'm sure had some um, impact on this incredible appetite that I was experiencing. Um, but I find this to be interesting topic because with all of the work that the Stronger by Science guys have been putting out, or not even their work, they've been talking about the work of Ponser and stuff. Um, but there's a lot of discussion around energy compensation. And the way that the Stronger by Science guys reviewed this was to basically say that it appears that energy compensation occurs quite significantly when you're in a diet, when you're in a deficit, and may not occur at all um, when you're in a surplus. So basically, th this means practically for the listener is that like, I went on this big ass hike. I, I kind of got lost. I was hiking around for six miles and it took me over two hours. Um, who knows how many calories I burned? That's kind of a different question. But whatever number of calories I burned, say it's a thousand. It's likely that I really only burned 60 to 70 percent of that because I'm in a deficit. And that's kind of what the, the literature is saying for for energy compensation. So there's this ambiguous like, OK, I burned 60 to 70 percent of that. But like, how do we account for that? Like, we don't even know how many calories I burned, much less how much of that was compensated for. So when you then are working with your clients, Aaron, in, in how would you, like if someone were to do this, what sort of adjustments or what sort of signs are you looking for here to determine um, how many more calories you may or may not eat uh, on that day or the next day as a result of this large cardiovascular expenditure? Yeah. So, so what I do with my clients is like, I don't try and chase acute fluctuations like that because there's so many assumptions you have to make. And, and what I will generally do is like, if you truly did burn like this incredible amount of calories sort of thing, like we'll see it on the scale, either the next morning or the two mornings. And, mm -hmm. and so that, that's, that's one part of it. Second, I will, if someone's like ravenous, you know, and they're like, Hey, I just like, I have a client who will like end up maybe playing like three pickup games of basketball, you know, in like a night thing. Mm -hmm. And we have like a little like unwritten agreement. Like if you're, if you're super starving, like when you come home, like just mash carbs, like go ham on watermelon, strawberries, right? If you go over your carbs by 50, whatever, like that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. um, but really you see it in your averages with weights over the next like three or four days. If you're, if you have like a big drop, you know, if, if like, let's say you're at like a 185, if you go down to like a 182 something, that's probably that. Um, for my clientele who are in like calorie deficits and do do things like that, I always instruct them to kind of go over on electrolyte balance type stuff to help bridge the gap of any kind of um, like, like, I don't want to like um, 
falsely deflated weigh-ins because you're just dehydrated sort of thing. Uh, and then that's what I'll do. And then if we get like a large uh, uh, divergence in hunger, irrespective of the consistent feeding framework sort of thing. So that's how I handle mm. it. Do you notice things like uh, higher scale readings for a couple of days as a result of inflammation after something like that? So that depends the type of thing. Like if I had, uh, I had a client who was, uh, we were in a deficit and we went that they wanted to do like Murph and I'm like, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to throw basically all the carbs on planet earth at you for like 48 hour period before it, your weight's going to go up. I don't care how many pounds because we're just going to fuel you for that. And then we just take, see what happens on the back end. Yep. You're going to be inflamed sort of thing. But after like three or four days, those things generally dissipate as long as there isn't like an acute injury or anything like that. That's the very, that's the nice thing about carbohydrate is the shifts are generally very acute and within like two to three days before, and then like two to three days after those, you know, carbohydrate induced fluctuations are generally returning to baseline rather, you know, quickly. Yeah. Cool. That's interesting. So about three or four days after I did this hike that was, you know, two hours and six miles and, um, and all that, I then went for my first uh, real mountain biking uh, adventure in Colorado. I did that on Sunday for Father's Day, so two days ago. And uh, this may have even been harder than the hike that I did. Uh, we, we biked up 1,200 foot of vertical up to a uh, single track mountain biking trail called Batasso, which is a, a well-known one around the, the Boulder area. And we did a bunch of single track for a while. And uh, ultimately, I ended up biking a total of like two hours, two and a half hours. Um, whatever it took, like two hours it took us to get up the mountain, it took us like 16 minutes to get down. It was one of those like really amazing experiences that I've actually never had before, where you see those people, you know, on those mountain roads, you know, biking up and you're like, man, that looks awful type thing. And it, 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 is, it is pretty awful. And then you get to the top and, you know, you bike the single track and then you're done and you're just like looking downhill and you're like, oh, let's fucking go, you know? And it was like, we did the whole thing in 16 minutes, got to the bottom bottom and it was just like this most exhilarating experience. Um, but that, uh, again, going back to my diet and, and my, my fuck ups, I think that, that those two cardiovascular events had a huge impact on that appetite that I was experiencing and, um, kind of my inability to control a lot of that. And it also made me a bit frustrated. Part of the impetus for, for my frustration with the diet right now is that during both of those experiences, I found myself like really fading quickly and I had brought protein drinks with me and carbs and, you know, a quest bar and an apple and, and stuff like that. And so I was stopping constantly and like having to consume stuff just so that I didn't like go hypoglycemic and basically feel like I was going to pass out. And so that's part of, uh, again, the mindset that I was experiencing. I think when I went and ate all that food was like, Hey, like I just felt like ass on these and I don't like this feeling type thing. So, um, anyway, a whole, a whole bunch of things coming together, cascade to create, um, what has happened the last four days for me. But, um, I guess on the positive side of all of this, my strength training, my lifting has been phenomenal. And I'm sure part of that has to do with the extra calories coming in. Um, but I'm, you know, 12, 13 weeks into this diet now, and I'm still improving on almost everything, especially lower body stuff. Um, all of my hamstring and quad stuff is pretty much going up every week with same RIRs. Um, most of my upper body stuff is either staying the same or going up as well, especially pulling movements are, are doing well. So, um, Ultimately, like I feel really good about that and and I couldn't be much happier. I have uh, three training sessions left in this in this whole cycle and it will be seven micro cycles, which uh, they're about six days each. So that's uh, 42 days of uh, of training without a deload or anything going through my my progression while dieting. So I'm, uh, I'm really excited to get through these final three days, take a extended deload period. And, uh, 
I was going to talk a little bit about my next meso cycle, but I think we can probably save that for some intros on the the following episode. Yeah, we can do that. The the last kind of thing uh, that I had, uh, my I forgot to cover it last week. I think um, last week I released my long awaited body measurements feature for my done for you client check-in system. That was by far the number one most uh, requested feature and it is out, it is live if you are someone who purchased it. Two weeks ago, two months ago, a year ago, right? You get that feature uh, for free. Please check your email, you have emails for me. Check the um, the tutorials course, it's in there where you can, you can get the updates and stuff like that. So please, by all means, go and grab that. And I think that's it on my updates. Sweet. Very cool. Well, we have uh, four topics for today that are all kind of all over the place, but I think that there's some interesting stuff here. So let's just start with the first one and, and dig into it a little bit. Um, the first one is it's just a brief touch on. It's a reminder of some stuff we've we've discussed before. But um, one of the things that, that I've always kind of been big on is the idea that deloads are almost always psychological for me and that uh there's been rarely if ever a time in my training where i've had two weeks of back-to-back like decrement in performance to the point where i'd be like oh well i'm clearly like really fatigued i should probably take a deload week now type thing and so i've had a lot of people as I've been going through my micro cycle and, you know, posting every or meso cycle rather and posting everything on my story, I've had a number of people DMing me and being like, dude, you're training past failure on like every movement and you haven't deloaded in, in six weeks, seven weeks type thing. Like how the fuck are you surviving? Like you're in a deficit and you're going past failure on stuff. Like what, what is the deal here? You know? Um, and, and it just kind of got me thinking that like a lot of people, probably are a little scared of fatigue. Like I, there's, there's certainly two ways of looking at it. Like if you're training like RP where your, your goal is literally to accumulate fatigue week to week, and you're going to add sets and volume until you reach a point where basically you're going to need a deload week. If you're taking a different approach to training where that's not your goal, like you're not trying to just add volume to to force this fatigue on yourself and then have to deload, then you really can work within what is recoverable volume for yourself and kind of play with variables along the way and um, and continue things a lot longer than you think. And so I just wanted to kind of put that message out there and state that I'm not crazy, that that I, I don't have this like amazing ability to recover that other people don't have. I just have a good understanding of where my training volume needs are, how much I can recover from, and that it really is this psychological fatigue piece of like, man, I just wake up one morning and and or a couple mornings and I don't have the same desire to train. I don't want to. The thought of, you know, loading 600 pounds on the hack squat is is this impending doom that I don't want to do. It doesn't mean that if I, I had to, that I couldn't go in and still do it. It's just that my desire to do so is diminished. And therefore, you know, I need a deload week to to mentally recover from that. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there, get some thoughts from you on that and see if there's anything else to say. Yeah. I mean, I, the, there was a way you phrased it that I really, really liked. You don't train in a way to like week over week dramatically. I shouldn't say dramatically, but like the goal isn't to increase fatigue so that I deload at week, week X. Like, I mean, after like with the RP style, when you have six hard sets on the hack squat, like there is no week seven where I do seven hard sets on the hack squat. Like that's, right, you're right. going to fucking die <laughs> or you're shooing those sets in, right? You're not going to like a one RIR sort of thing. Like you, you will overload your CNS to, I mean, in a, a pretty substantial degree doing things like that. You need to deload. When you don't train like that, you're not accumulating fatigue nearly. And this is something that I personally haven't really expressed my views, my personal approaches on. I shouldn't necessarily say my views as much um, because it's in like a minority. But I mean, we've talked about it on the podcast a little bit before. I, I don't, I rarely plan deloads into my training unless 
um, like someone else is doing my training, like Alex is doing my training. When he says deload, I'm not going to be like, no, dude, you know, I'm going to listen. <laughs> but when I'm doing my own training, like I generally train in a way that doesn't, I'm not adding volume by sets. And then I like to really just run it and see, like when I was dieting last year, when we were in, in Salt Lake, I, I continued to progress throughout the end of my diet, you know, and I never deloaded. And I felt really, really good, but I wasn't like ramping things up. I was still improving. I was adding a set. I was still micro loading things. And I'm like, I don't, I feel really, really good. Um, and I think it does, there are aspects of, of your lifestyle that can either help or hinder that, right? Food quality, stress management, sleep, all these like aspects that are impactful that people generally don't talk about, right? People think of like silos, people be like, man, I, I need a deal of this week, not realizing that they're like stressed the fuck out at work, their girlfriend left them. And um, there was one more I was gonna use. Oh, and they're sleeping like shit because of the two prior yeah. things. Like the, the, they're all related is, is what I'm getting at. And when you're better yeah. at managing the things that indirectly influence how you may need or not need a, a, a deload, it, it, it all does come together for sure. Yeah. And it's not linear, like this fatigue oftentimes, like, so, so preparedness, we've used this word before on the podcast, but like your daily preparedness, it oscillates. So if you come into the gym one day and you don't improve, or maybe you even slide backwards one day, like it would be a little premature to say, oh my gosh, oh, woe is me. I didn't improve. I, I must need a deload week. I'm completely overstretched, you know, when in reality, it could be exactly like you said, where something or many things are not in line where they need to be. And that if you come back the following week or even in three days and do another session, things might might continue to improve. And I noticed this in mine as well. Like there are times where I won't improve for a week. Maybe I'll even slip back a rep but I won't really worry about it too much. I'll just make a note and be like, Hey, lost a rep from last week. You know, is what it is, blah, blah, Come back the next week, get that rep back. And then the week after that gain another rep. So if I would have deloaded at that point, I would have deloaded unnecessarily because I was able to continue improving, um, in subsequent weeks after that. So, um, just some stuff to keep in mind. And you know, if, if it, I'm not to say that, that physiological fatigue doesn't exist. Like if you do find yourself struggling with these, factors of preparedness, then yeah, maybe a deload is, is the right, the right approach. But, um, I think for most people, the need to deload is probably more psychological than physical, unless you're following a program that's just way above your recovery capacity. Yep. Cool. Um, sweet. Well, I think this actually plays in a little bit to, uh, one of the next things I want to talk about, which is this idea of grinding reps. And so, Let's see, how, how should I intro this? A couple months ago, maybe it was a year ago at this point, Lyle McDonald and Mike from RP had the, the big debate, not the bait, the debate, the back and forth on YouTube videos where they were basically just slandering each other online, um, discussing basically the thought Lyle was saying that, that Mike doesn't actually train to failure because his rep speed never slows. And then Jeff Nipper did this big video about how as you're approaching failure, rep speed should slow type thing. And I would say that for the most part, I'm in agreement with all of that. Like if you're truly going to work to failure on a movement, you should see that rep speed slow as you approach failure. But there is something interesting. It goes, the argument can go a little bit further than that and become a little bit more nuanced. And so I'm going to use the example of a seated cable row, because this is one that I think I can just, a lot of people can just kind of grind on. Um, I've seen you do it, Aaron. I've seen Birdo do it. It's just, it's just a movement very conducive to grinding. So you, you're doing this rear delt row where your elbows are about 30 to 45 degrees from your side. You're in a cable position. Your torso is mostly vertical, maybe slightly lean back. Um, and as you row, you're just kind of going through, you're getting like full rear delt retraction at the back of your reps. But as you fatigue, you kind of reach the sticking point at maybe 95% of the range of motion. And then you kind of stick and then you go. And then the next one's maybe 90%, but you kind of like grind through it and you're fighting and you kind of make it through. And it feels like you can just do this forever. Like I feel personally that maybe I've been able to grind six to seven, eight reps just 
in that short position, you know, having grit and, and pushing through. Well, there's two potential problems that might occur when you're doing excessive levels of grinding like that. One would be that like a mini compensation occurs. And uh, for me, like I think for there are two ways that, that people do this. One would be you're kind of going and then you kind of push your chest forward because it's a way of like changing the angle of how far your elbows get is if you just move your chest forward, it's kind of the same effect as if you just moved your elbows back. But it's not really actually shortening that rear delt fully. And then the other way, this is the way that I more commonly do it is that I tend to drop my elbows. So as I'm getting into this rear delt retraction position, my elbow will just drop maybe one or two degrees and it just gives me a little bit more lat in there um, to help get more range of motion at the end of that rep, a little of the thoracic lat. So either way, what's happening there is this like a teeny compensation or the secondary effect is that it's just more neurologically fatiguing because you're having to continue to fight and grind through something that, that you don't want to do. It's almost like an isometric. Like it's like, hey, take this board and just push against it as hard as you can. I mean, that's kind of what's happening when you're trying to like grind through these short positions of these movements. So when I was on this podcast with Cass and uh, Dave McConey and Abel a few days ago, uh, I asked Cass about this because it had been something that had been on my mind and I'd seen a number of other people that follow similar philosophies of training to me, uh, not grinding through those positions. So then the alternative to not grinding would just be like, okay, you're going through, you're doing your rear delt rows. And then when you reach that like soft stop where you could kind of grind through it, you just don't. You just kind of hit that soft stop and then you you release gently, go to the, the stretch position, pull again, release gently, right? And as you pull that soft stop, where that soft stop is, it gets gradually uh, closer to the stretched position uh, each rep. So it's almost like you start doing partials where you could grind, but you just don't. You just kind of let that range of motion fall off as it does. And I, 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 it's an, it's just a very interesting idea because it kind of goes against how I've been conditioned to feel that like, you know, this rep speed should slow significantly as you approach failure. And, um, that's where like the real benefit is, is like fighting through that position and, and all of these things. But it's kind of made me think of it differently and reframed, uh, the way that I look at grinding through some of those reps. What do you, what do you think about all that? I have, I have a, a decent set of thoughts, to be completely honest. Okay, um, cool. I did listen to that, right? And I mean, not not that I think I have a, a very valid uh, viewpoint on it, but the compensation uh, theory makes perfect sense to me, right? You are compensating different, you know, musculature to help move that weight. Um, my the place where I like to play devil's advocate, if we're talking large. Um, centrally fatiguing movements like an RDL, a squat, a hack squat, those sort of things, those compensations can can potentially lead to like a, an increased risk of injury. I'm pretty sure that's how I hurt my back, right? Grinding through really strict like RDLs to where like I was, you get like that jackhammering almost thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, those things I would agree, you probably don't want to take those compensations. The risk of injury is there the neurological fatigue is incredibly high. Anytime I would do one of those sets of, of an RDL like that, it would demolish me. If we're talking about a rear delt row, I'm not arguing that it's not neurologically fatiguing. Where the devil's advocate comes in is like, but how much neurological fatigue are you really accumulating with compensating maybe a little bit of teres, um, thoracic lat on a rear delt row? like? Is that uh, enough to create a, a tangible effect of diminished performance and maybe a subsequent movement? I'm not sure. With a quad or a hamstring, 100%. With the rear delt, yeah. I just, I, I'm not, I don't know is what I'm getting at there. 
I think the grinding on those like length and movements you mentioned, like the RDLs and the squats and stuff, it's kind of like when you grind a rep on that one, that's your last rep. Like you don't really have another grindy rep in you after that. Like it's like you get one grindy rep and then you're done. So essentially avoiding the grind on a movement like that is is like you're at one RIR or something. You're one to two RIR if you're not grinding, you know, which I think is a completely acceptable way to train like a, a massively fatiguing length and movement like that. The, the row is, and the other short overload movements though, like to your point, totally. Um, but also like if we're going to be super nuanced about it and if there's going to be like these little mini compensations occurring, then maybe like you, there's a little bit more benefit to just keep the tension on the muscle that you're doing. And when your rear delt can no longer retract on its own, then maybe there's just more benefit in lengthening it again and taking it to where it can get to uh, versus trying to sh force it into a short position that's already fatigued. Um, but, you know, the the neurological fatiguing piece is interesting because I think neurological fatigue also encompasses psychological fatigue, right? It's kind of like a whole systemic type thing. It includes all of the different levels of fatigue. And in the last two weeks since I stopped going through those like large numbers of grindy reps on things like cable spider curls and uh, cable rear delt rows and the other similar movements like that. Um, it's kind of made me less apprehensive about going into sets because literally, okay. So, so on my rear delt row, uh, the week that I grinded, I hit 160 for 10 or 11, but the last four reps basically were these things that were six second reps, like just trying to get, get short, you know? And so you, you have like 20 or 25 seconds where you're just spending grinding. Um, where in the, then the next week when I implemented it, I used the same weight, but instead of getting 10 or 11, I think I did seven or eight. And then I just let the range of motion fall off and hit four or five partials. So I ended up getting 12 or 13 contractions for the muscle instead of 10 or 11. Um, it's just that these contractions weren't necessarily as short or like, like they, they didn't get as short, a uh, short overload is what I meant, but the length of the actual rep was much shorter because instead of grinding for six seconds, every rep, I would just kind of hit and release type thing. Um, so, so psychologically it was, it created more enjoyment out of my training and it, and it made it less. Uh, fatiguing psychologically going into each set, knowing that I didn't have to sit there and spend six seconds per rep to grind for the last four reps type thing. Um, so I think there's that component too. And, and ultimately like to put a bow on this one, like the way Cass kind of described it on the podcast too, that I think makes the most sense is like, Hey, if you're getting to a point in your training where you have to even think about, should I grind this rep or not, then you're already working like to the level of effort that you need in your training. So whether you grind one rep or you let your range of motion fall off for a couple reps, like, like you're there, you're doing a good job, you know? And that's what I was going to say, say is my like last piece of it. Like for a rear delt row. Yeah. You might want, it, maybe you want to grind a rep or two. If you don't want to do that, you may probably want to add a few partials into it just to like yeah. maximize your effort on a set to like, you know, if you're trying to like not leave any stones unturned sort of thing, but uh, one of the effort, one or the other, you're going to put in, put, put extra additional effort in somewhere. Yep. yep. Um, cool. Well, also related to this a little bit, um, another on this podcast with, with Cass, you know, we were, it was called a come at me, bro was kind of the name of the podcast because Cass had proposed to us that, that we kind of try to tear him down or, you know, ask him tough questions or whatever. And so, one of the questions I proposed was like, why short overload movements? Like, like why? What is the reason? Like you, you invented this movement, the press around, right? And yet people for ages, for decades have been doing bodybuilding training that didn't do any short overload movements for chest at all. They only did dumbbell presses, barbell presses, and dumbbell flies. Like that was it for chest for, for decades until cables were invented and stuff. So 
Why do we go short? Like, okay, why is a press around even that much better that it's worth doing than just taking two cables and doing a cable press where you're still getting some adduction, you're still getting the cable to move across the body, you're still short overloading the movement, you're just failing to get that last like one or two degrees of adduction across the chest that you would be able to get by doing it single arm that you can't get by doing it double arm. And so I propose this question to him, like, just why? Why do we have to do that? What is the benefit? Especially knowing that length and overload movements are going to be the profound stimulus for building muscle, right? Um, and he gave me a couple answers that I didn't really expect. So I have my own kind of thoughts on, on why I would include short overload movements. Um, but the one that he threw out was orthopedic. And I thought that was really interesting because the short position of one muscle is the length in position of another, which you and I were like all up on after we took the N1 thing. We were like, oh my God, the arcs of motion, right? And yet like in the moment, I was kind of like, I wasn't focused on, on that. My brain wasn't, wasn't thinking about that. So when he said like, yeah, when you do your press around and you shorten the pec, you are lengthening the lat the, the iliac lat or whatever version of very, uh, whatever region of the lat is co cor correlating to the region of the chest that's being worked. And so orthopedically, I didn't really even think about that, right? Like it makes sense if I'm only doing lengthened overloads for one, for like my chest say, but I'm doing shorts for my, for my lats, then I'm again, lengthening the chest by shortening the lat. So, so it's like all of this um, like th there just seems to be a necessity maybe for long-term sustainability to train the shortened and the length in positions of each muscle as antagonists. Um, so I thought that that one was super interesting. And then, um, he brought up a couple other ones, which, which I had considered. Uh, so I'll jump into those real quick too. So, um, fatigue management is, is one that he brought up. And I think this is kind of an obvious one, but I, I didn't, I didn't question him on, on the spot. But I think you could argue then like, cause he said, you know, what if you just get more out of doing six sets of this movement instead of having to do three sets of that one? And I'm like, yeah, but like, what if, you know, three sets of incline curls was just as good as six sets of spider curls. And now you did it in half the amount of time type thing. So, so the fatigue management one I think is, is arguable. Um, and something I may ask him about in the future as well. Um, and then, uh, I see you highlighted one as well, which was shuttle facilitate glucose, uh, into the muscle cells. And so that was one that I think is, is somewhat obvious if you understand metabolic training principles. Uh, but again, one that like in the moment, as I was speaking with him, wasn't in like the forefront of my brain. So if, if you're in a phase of training where shuttling those types of nutrients into your muscle cells is, is kind of the objective, then obviously, uh, short overload movements would help facilitate that. Um, you can train with increased frequency with short overload movements. So, um, you could like, I think that's actually a perfect example in my training program. Now, how I have my big quad lengthen day where everything gets really sore, but, and then if I were to do another quad lengthen day, I'd probably have to wait five or six days to do it again, but I can throw this like short overload leg extension in there after three days and that's fine. And it doesn't impact my recovery. So, so I think there's a huge, uh, use of short overload movements there as well. And then the last one that Cass, um, I think agrees with, but wouldn't like come out and state confidently just because of the state of the research right now is regional hypertrophy, uh, which is that some parts of the muscle are going to hypertrophy more than others at different points of a movement. So there was, uh, we believe a leg extension study that was referenced where the, uh, the part closer to the knee, like the VMO grew more, uh, at the short position, whereas the part distal, I believe, closer to the hip uh, grew, no, it's the other way, proximal, closer to the hip, uh, grew more at the length in position of the leg extension. And then Cass was saying that in some of the tests that they have done at the lab, that they've actually seen uh, the similar response in testing the long head of the tricep that there's different parts of the long head that activate when you're in the stretch position overhead versus being in the shortened position overhead. So, um, so I think that's another potential aspect or benefit of short overload movement. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, I think comes down to like, what, what are some other 
contexts or, or sorry, what is a specific context for like the client, the thing you're doing? Cause like the orthopedic is a great one. The one that I really highlighted in the most kind of practical scenario I see is client wants fat loss. Maybe they have some, you know, glucose uh, sensitivity or insulin, you know, sensitivity issues. You can use a much more short range movements to do metabolic style training to, you know, basically, um, further, well, not influence, but yeah, influence, you know, glucose uptake into those larger muscle groups. And then if you're training them shortened, right, you can add a higher volume and then you can do a higher frequency with more mm. shortened range. So this, that can like help your fat loss just through burning through more glucose. Um, so, I mean, it, yeah, really it's, it's just the context isn't maximizing hypertrophy, right? Which is generally what we're talking about, you know? So that's where, like one of those things where like, what is the context? And that really does, right. it is important for, for, you know, what may be the most appropriate answer. Mm -hmm. No, totally. I agree. And that's, that's good context that you added as well. Um, cool. Well, the last topic here for the day is uh, we had a question on our Instagram Q and A from two episodes ago. Uh, about minimum session volume. And so we kind of theorized or discussed around the, the idea that it depends on how close to failure you're working. Like if you're going to absolute failure or past failure, like who's to say one set isn't equivalent to three sets at three RIR, right? So the literature seems to show that three sets is yeah, the minimum maybe for, for in session volume per, per muscle group. But again, like, just like I said, you know, what if those three sets are three RIR versus one set to zero RIR plus some partials or whatever. And, and we kind of theorize that they would be relatively equivalent. So maybe there isn't actually a minimum session volume. It's a minimum session, like intensity threshold of sorts. Um, so the same guy wrote back and said he had a follow-up question and he said, as you become more advanced, how do you know when the muscle is recovered enough to train it again? How do you know you're not waiting too long to hit it again? And what signs can you look for? And so this is interesting because it also plays into the question of in session volume. It's a follow up question of sorts, because if you did one set even to failure or three sets to three RIR, you can probably recover a lot faster and train that muscle again than if you did five sets to zero RIR or 10 or 12 sets to three RIR type thing. So just generally, you know, whether whichever side of the spectrum you're falling on and however much volume you're doing in your training session, uh, what are some things that we can look for to, uh, to determine whether we should be training that muscle again? Yeah. So the first kind of couple things I had here were more subjective perception type stuff, which is general soreness, right? How sore are you? That's a really, really easy one. Um, but then also like a general fatigue in that muscle. So what I would consider this is like, it's kind of like a grade under soreness. Like you're not sore, but you're, you can feel fatigue in them. And the other note I had here is I find this is more perceivable in lower body than like upper body. Um, when I, the last time I was like dieting, I would find that like my legs wouldn't be sore, but like they would just be kind of like a little, they felt heavier as I would like be going up the stairs and I could tell they just like weren't recovered uh, sufficiently yet. So those are like the kind of two big, you know, kind of perceivable ones that, that immediately come to mind for me. But to add a little bit more context to this, and I think this really lends itself nicely to the conversation we've had today with some of these other questions is, what, how intelligently is your training designed, right? So maybe the prior session was all shortened overload movements. You should generally be able to recover quicker from these than if you were doing much more lengthened or maybe lengthened plus a pause at the fully, you know, in the, in, in the eccentric position, because that's going to be more damaging, generally will take a little bit longer to recover. So that's where, you know, they, they, some of it is pure, you know, perception type of thing, but then also like an understanding training in intelligent training, either designing intelligent training yourself or having someone do it for you can really help you understand that there uh, as well. So those are kind of like the first three things that, that come to mind with this question. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I mean, you pretty much nailed all of that. So I'll just kind of like maybe expand and add a little personal anecdote, but um, 
But yeah, I think soreness and fatigue are going to be the main two characteristics that you're looking for. Um, and I think that soreness isn't always great because you can still have a little bit of soreness, but be recovered. And so, uh, the, the fatigue one is, is more the one I would focus on because I think fatigue would insinuate that you're not recovered. Um, but being able to acutely assess like, Hey, I'm still too fatigued. I don't think I can, I can do this today type thing is, is a skill that's probably learned over time. Um, and something that's honed, right? So I'll provide an example for me. Um, in the way my program is structured right now, I have my short overload leg extensions on my hamstring day. And then I have this other quad day that's basically all lengthened. So I did uh, my big lengthened quad day. And then I have two full rest days where I train uh, upper body one of the days, but two rest days from lower body. And then on the third day, I come in and I train hamstrings and then I'm supposed to do my short overload leg extensions all throughout this cycle. The whole time um, I've still had minor soreness by the time I get to the hamstring day, I've still had minor soreness in my quads, but I've been fine. And, and I've, I've been able to do my warm up sets for leg extensions and, um, and know that I'm going to be okay. Like I would do a warm up set or two, increase some weight and be like, I got this, you know, it's fine. Just in my last session, um, I did my hamstrings the other day and I went to warm up my leg extensions and I, I could tell the same level of like minimal soreness that I've had in my quads almost every time that I do this. But I did my first warm up set and I was like, huh, that feels a little weird, but you know, let's take a short break. We'll come back and we'll do another warm up set because usually the second warm up set, you kind of can tell whether you just kind of need that first one just to like grease the groove, do the movement pattern type thing. Second warm up set, I still felt like I just didn't have that pop in my quads that I wanted and it felt like it wasn't contracting fully at the top. So I just, I just called it a day. I was like, you know what? I don't think my quads are actually recovered right now. They actually have this kind of perceived fatigue that you mentioned and, and I didn't do them. So the next morning I came back and I did them the next morning and I exceeded performance and they felt great and everything was fine. And so um, acutely, like maybe I would have been okay if I would have done them the day prior to, like maybe I could have pushed psychologically through and just done it, but going to the next day kind of ensured, it was like a safety of sorts that ensured that I would be 100% recovered and I'd be ready to go. These things can change over time. So for 11 weeks, I've been doing this or however long, and I've just been hitting my, my leg extensions with no big deal. This week, I didn't feel the same, so it changed. It wasn't the same as prior weeks. I took an extra rest day and did it again. So you just kind of have to look out for signs like that within yourself, and then it all kind of circles back to the programming piece that Aaron mentioned, is that like if you're going to have this one big quad day that's super lengthened overloaded, then you probably need to have that other day that's just short so that you can manage your fatigue. Maybe you have a day that's kind of mixed. You have some short stuff and some lengthened stuff, so the damage isn't quite as high as it would be if you just had like this big lengthened day. So then maybe three or four days later, you can just train your legs all over again. Uh, maybe you're not doing much volume. So you're doing like, you know, one, one or two sets of squats one day and then Two days later, you can do leg extensions. And then two days after that, you can do pendulum squat. And two days after that, you can do leg extensions again. Um, it really depends how you're organizing your training. Uh, but I think looking at that factor of A, soreness, but not putting too much credence in soreness because understanding that you can still perform even if you're lightly sore, right? Um, but that, that sense of fatigue is important. And then just going through trial and error and um, probably making sure that you start on the lower side of volume and effort. Because if you're if you're going to push the limit of when you can recover, then starting slow and being able to to add in volume and intensity is is important as you adapt. Uh, versus the other way, you know, if you start too high, then you find yourself pulling things out and that can be a, a little bit disconcerting. So um, I would just say, you know, if you're going to push that limit, then do it prudently 
And you can always just do it on the safe side and not have to push that limit. Because at the end of the day, like if you're training quads every five days because you feel safe that, you know, I'm at least going to be recovered or it's like I'm going to try and design this program that allows me to train them every three or four days. You're getting a couple extra quad sessions in over the course of a year or maybe even less over the course of a three month mesocycle. Right. So it then becomes an opportunity cost of how much is it worth trying to fit an extra quad session in versus just taking an extra rest day. There we go. Yeah. I mean, I agree a hundred percent there. It, it really start on the low end and then you can kind of find where it's going to be that sweet spot for you for sure. I feel like, and I, I know this from personal, like direct personal experience. I would do the complete opposite and err on the high side and crush myself for a while. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's rather just to just start lower and then find that sweet spot instead of thinking that you're Superman or that you're special or the rules don't apply to you because uh, odds are that they actually do. Yep. 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 Totally. Anything cool. else from you? Well, I think that's it. On this one, Brian? No, man. No, that's it, dude. Cool. As always, guys, thank you for listening. Next week, we're going to have a pretty cool episode as we will talk around some different um, approaches and things that we consider with coaching strategies. And that should be a fun one for Brian and I. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week.